Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. On the show today, a look back, of course, on all the racing action from Aragon as Carnage out on track has left the title battle spicier than ever. The 2023 grid is also officially complete, so we'll take you through the final pieces of the jigsaw for that. And then it's straight into another race weekend and the return of Japan. The recording date is Tuesday, the 20th of September. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash Moto GP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Uh, morning, everybody. Welcome back. Another week. And uh, well, 2022 Moto GP. We were talking right at the start of the season, maybe not one of the best years in terms of action, but my word, it certainly kicked up a notch, hasn't it? Enea Bastianini finally getting the better of Pecco Bagnaia to win in Aragon and Fabio Quattararo's comfortable championship lead now up in flames after a crash on lap one following contact with Marc Marquez on his returning weekend. First of all, Pete, can we just talk through what happened on lap one? Well, it's never dull with Mark Marquez around, is it? You know, he'd been out since May. He comes back, starts 13th on the grid. He's sixth after two corners. So, you know, amazing. Just that in racer's instinct that he's got. And then, yeah, bit of a moment coming out of turn three. Quattararo, who he had started in sixth. He'd lost a place to Mark, so he's seventh. We know he struggles to overtake. He has to push hard on those opening laps. So he's trying to make the most of every last bit he can through the corners. Right behind Mark. Mark has his moment. Backs off a bit. Fabio hits the back of him thrown straight over the front, down the road, he goes. Everyone avoids him, luckily. He got hit by his bike, though, and then and ended up with some chest burns and everything else. Rins' race was ruined there and then. Some of the wing, it seems, got lodged in Marquez's bike. Marquez continued, said that he got to turn five, and it, and it felt kind of okay. So he, he carried on again, got to the exit of turn seven, activated the ride height device, and this piece of fairing uh, or wing sort of got jammed as the bike sort of uh, compressed at the back, if you like. And so it began to sort of pull the bike to one side. And he then went across the track and collided with Nakagami. Again, Mark stayed up, but Nakagami went down and there were bikes and riders going everywhere. So, yeah, uh, very dramatic few corners. And as you say, especially in terms of the title chase, because 10 points with five rounds to go, it might as well be zero, really. Well, a lot of people then, Keith, uh... A lot of social media blaming Mark Marquez, but it, it seemed like just a bit of a, a series of unfortunate events. What did you make of, uh, of the lap one carnage? I've been waiting for this moment for a few days. <laughs> Everyone breathe. Every, take in. a deep breath, everybody. <laughs> Forget about the social media side of things. I mean, people that don't race motorcycles probably don't quite see it the way that it actually is. That's got to be the underlying thing. For me... It's all the other clickbait merchants and all the people sitting behind keyboards who are writing for whatever publication or non-publication, or even in the case of some television commentators, I've got to say. You know, when you've got a, a, a non-racing tubby journo behind his keyboard trying to emulate a five times, six times, seven times, or in this case, eight times world champion, it just gets right up my nose. It's hysteria for clickbait. I can't stand it. It drives me absolutely insane the fact of the matter is it's a reflex action it's opening lap if you look across all of the races everybody was having a little bit of grip trouble early on in an opening lap it's also an opportunity to make up space we all do it everyone that races a motorbike everybody that races anything in fact if there's an opportunity to make up space in those first two or three bends you will make it up it's brilliant around the outside he was got getting himself in a good position mark marquez and the back just let go a little bit that's it happens. You know, he, he, it spun up a little bit. Traction control will have been set for a little bit more grip. So, therefore, it, it, it didn't bang in perhaps like it would have done if it had been a lap or two later when there was a bit more heat in the tyres. It's a reflex action. And, you know, some of the hysteria that, that you, know, you know, there was one that, that was speculating whether he did it on purpose. I mean, what, what goes on in these people's heads? I've got no clue at all. So, a little bit of lack of grip. It wouldn't even be thinking about shutting the throttle it would have been just a reflex roll just to get the thing back where it was and unfortunately for the likes of Quattararo he was in close because he's trying to take advantage as you've already said in the preamble of course he is he needs to make up those bases he can't be on that back straight that long fast back straight miles in arrear so he's trying to make up space it's normal arrogant it's a normal race it's just unfortunate the way I had. Nakagami was a bit unfortunate he 
you know, he got the thing sat down and it was probably just, I mean, I think it looked like it was still still wheeling a little bit, just a tiny bit off the road as Marquez was in his way. Now, Marquez had got some, some of Quattararo's fairing jammed under the, the rear wheel, interfering with the forward motion of the Honda. So that was unfortunate. So Nakagami, I feel genuinely sorry for. Quattararo, he will have been annoyed, but, you know, I think even Lynn Jarvis said it's a racing incident. You know, and Lynn Jarvis has, has been been out of his shell lately when it comes to criticism of people if uh, if he feels the need. But it's a it's the it's the whipping up of the the clickbait that really gets on my nerves and obviously on other people's nerves as well. I I read a piece only this morning actually from Ben Spees. You know, he's a guy who can ride a motorbike. You don't get much better than Ben Spees, and he's had a right old swipe. Um, I mean. I listen sometimes, not particularly in this case, but in some some cases, I listen to some commentary on TV and you think, you know, these guys, this guy's not even ridden a motorbike at this level. It's not something you can comment about if you've not done it. That should be the domain of the expert. You know, Terry Reimer, I always get messages when I'm watching TV and Terry Reimer's sending me messages saying how much it annoys him. It's like there are sorts, there are riders and people with the experience of riding motorbikes around the world who are going, what, what? You know, and you kind of, you want to throw things at the TV. Otherwise, it's really, really good. But clickbait is what it is. Headlines. Do you remember what happened with us and Peko? Oh, yeah. You know, like he read the headline. He didn't listen to the podcast. Yeah, the fact was that we were defending. I was defending him as a, a sportsman, but unfortunately, he read the headline. Now, there's nothing wrong with the headline. The headline is right, and that's what draws you in to to listen to or read whatever there is to come. Um, it's there for that specific reason. You can't criticise that. But when that becomes the full article, you know, the speculation goes all the way through till you get to the truth. You know, on about the fourth or fifth paragraph, it's just there to, to for people to get clicks and likes. And I mean, I think that that. You know, unfortunately, that is the style of journalism that we're in in the in the main now. Sorry, Pete. I know you're not included in that, but you know, there are still great journalists out there that are bringing great content. You know, Matt Oxy still does. Um, that's a fact. It was quite interesting. Um, they were they were wondering whether because of the Ducati situation, where you've got Bastianini beating Bagnaia. I know we'll probably come to this, although we haven't talked about it yet, but. You know, Bastianini, should Ducati have allowed him to to beat Bagnaia? I mean, those five points that he's pinched off Bagnaia could be critical as we move on through the, the last few rounds of this series. And you would have thought that with the pace that Bastianini's got, that Ducati would have had a word with, with um, Pramac. Or you might have thought, maybe not. Let's have true sport. Let's not have these inter-team kind of ganging up on, on Quattararo-type scenarios. And if that's the case, damn good on Ducati. Let them race. It's always the best way for the fans, and <clears throat> certainly the best for the sport. But they might rue that. You know, five points is a lot of points. And Quattararo is going to come to a few races where he's going to be um, something like more on the on the. Yeah, you know, when we get to to Motegi, where they've not been since 2019, you know, he's going to be pretty hard to beat round there. I reckon Quattararo. Well, it's uh, it's certainly spiced up the MotoGP Championship when it looked a little bit forlorn for the others, and and Fabio Quartararo was uh, starting to run away with it. We should say that thankfully, you know, Fabio, Taka, and Mark all okay, even though Pete Fabio had another incident on his way to the medical centre on the back of a, a scooter with a marshal. He did, yes. I mean, it just sums up his day, doesn't it? Um, you know, first lap accident, hit by his own bike, uh, burns on his chest, looked really nasty. And then when he's going back to the medical center, he falls off. Well, the marshal hit head on with another scooter. But then we talked to Brad Binder later in the day and he went, you know what, guys, some of the scariest moments I've had have been on the back of bikes with marshals when there's gravel on the road. I mean, these service roads, they're not they're not like they're not like part of the racetrack. You know, they have bits of gravel, they have holes in them and everything else. And he says, I'm pleased I'm wearing leathers when I'm on there. And, and as Fabio said, he was glad he had his helmet on. I think uh, he was fine. But as he said, the marshal was a bit sore. Interestingly, though, um, and I think um, I'm just thinking whether Nikki Kovac, I think it was, um, journalist, a good journalist, actually, lady journalist out in all of the GPs. She found a lady that had taken photographs of, um, I mean, it looked like he got a bit of nipple rash. Um, Cotteraro's leathers were open after that crash. And the, the damage he had, the grazes he had to his chest was because his leathers came open again. Um that's not the first time we've heard that about Quattararo showing off his chest, that's for sure. But there was speculation that he might have gained the injury through the through the, the Marshalls crash. Um, sensible riders, 
always grab the handlebars of the Marshall's bike and drive the Marshall back. To, <laughs> to <pit home. laughs> Those who jump on the back do take their life uh, in other people's hands, which is never a good idea. Yeah. I I, um, I want to come on to, to talking more, obviously, about um, Peko and as you alluded to there, you know, the, uh, the Ducati team orders, should there have been or not. But obviously, it was a big weekend for Marc Marquez coming back. Yes, race ended early. But how would you look back, Keith, at his first weekend uh, back racing? Successful? Bar the, I bar think the incident. So. <laughs> I, I, no, I think so. I think that it, it was successful from the point of view that it's got to be a build-up. I mean, it always amuses me when, the, you know, it's almost disrespectful to everyone else in the field when people are expecting Mark Marcos to finish in the top whatever it is. Um, you know, this is really, really close racing, and we're in, we're in the business end of the season. You know, everyone's as sharp as sharp can be, and even the likes of Mark Marquez coming back into that arena, and everyone expecting him to be sort of, you know, wherever they expect him to be, is 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 really an underestimation of everyone else, and an overestimation of uh, of what he'll achieve after being as uh, ring rusty as he is. You know, he's he's not got the. Yeah, you know, I think Pete wrote it earlier on. He, he did something like thirty nine laps on on one day. You know, he wrote it on crash. And you know, it's bloody hard work riding one of these motorbikes. This is these are not easy things to ride. Uh, they may be easier than going back to the two-stroke days, but physically, the actual you know braking, acceleration, and all the other areas that actually sap your strength are much faster um, than they were in the old days. I mean, we quite often hear about two-strokes were the day. You know, men were men when they rode two-strokes. Back to the back, men were men when they rode two-strokes because they got no grip and a power band of about 2,000 RPM or, or, or not much more. So therefore, you were likely to be sent to the moon, no traction control or, or any of those particular things. So that's why men were men back in the day. Now, the physicality of racing a motorcycle at the level they are, at the consistency that they're racing them at, um, you are, you've are you got to be much, much, much fitter than probably you were back in the day. You've got to be brave back in the day. You've got to be fit now. Um, and that's how I see it. Uh, I think Mark Marquez has had a good couple of weeks i mean this one do you know what he, he might just think to himself what the bloody hell have i got to do to stay out of trouble all i wanted was a good run at arrogant and here he is but he with all the usual criticism i mean every troll in the world got on his case over it you know it's a it's a racing incident there was no more to it than that and it and he was as big a victim of it in the end because he didn't get a run that he was expecting that to to get he didn't get his next you know part of the jigsaw in the in the train of of recuperation yeah, I was worth saying, I, I was at most of the debriefs after the race and none of the other riders that I heard criticised Mark for that incident with Quattararo. It was just one of those things. You also had a late passing Bastianini at the same time, I think, didn't you? So Mark was sort of trying to go inside a bit, et cetera, et cetera. So none of the other riders saw that, including Quattararo. Um, you know, he didn't sort of hint that he felt there was anything untoward had happened there. The only thing he did hear was the Nakagami incident. There was a bit of a mixed opinions about that. Should Mark have maybe been aware that he had some bike damage there? But then there were some other people that said Nakagami should have seen Mark was coming across and actually, you know, taken some action to avoid that. So, yeah, to be honest, from the rider point of view, from what I heard, there was no no hint of criticism at Mark for the for the incident with Quattararo. Um, and I think, to be honest, this was always going to happen to Quattararo sooner or later because of the situation he's in with that bike and, and not being able to overtake. And if he doesn't qualify on the on the front row, if he's on the second row or the third row, he has to do these sort of, you know, flat out laps trying to get people around the corners. It was going to happen, you know, one way or another, I think. You just can't keep doing that race in, race out at this level. As Keith says, knowing that you, it's not about getting to the back straight and overtaking people, picking people off. He's got to go for it in the corners. And the start is the best chance to do that. So, you know, I just think that Cotterard is paying the price for trying to get 110% from that Yamaha all the time. Well, perhaps he is. And now the gap, just 10 points between himself and Peko Bagnaia. But it could be less, couldn't it, as you alluded to, Keith, if uh, Ducati had maybe intervened and let Aldenair Bastianini, well, not let him, just stopped him from coming through. But it just seemed that Bastianini's pace outright in a straight line was just so m far more superior than Peko's that the writing was on the wall, although he did a spectacular move to make that win uh, happen. It was. Yeah, that was a spectacular move. I mean, it was almost a reef. He saw the gap and went for it straight mm. away, but it was a beautiful move. I, I bloody leapt off the settee. Mm. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great move. I mean, really, really caught, caught Bang Iron napping. Bastian, Bastianini, I mean, he's quite a light fella as well. So, I mean, the powder-weight ratio seems to work really well for him and so on and so forth. But he give, 
I think we're in that domain nowadays where the bikes are so equal. It's very, very difficult to make a pass. I think, again, with, with the amount of horsepower these things are turning out, slipstream does have an effect, but not that bigger effect when it comes to the big bikes. Um, it was a brilliant move. Regarding the team thing, I'm glad that there isn't any team order. Um, the, the, the slightly complicated situation here for Bastianini is, I mean, he's fired a shot now, hasn't he? And Bagnaia now knows what he's up against next year. They're going to be teammates of the big red uh, Dukes next year. And that's Bastianini <laughs> basically saying, you ain't going to get no help from me, mate. And I think that Bagnaia and Bastianini next year are going to be a real force to be reckoned with. Ducati, yeah, OK, they, they could have had a quiet word with Pramac. I don't think that was the right thing to do. I don't think they did. Otherwise, they might have done it. I think from all of our perspectives, looking in, seeing two guys racing like they were, that's what we want to see. Um, you might get orders within a same team scenario, but don't forget, Pramac are outside sponsors. That's not Ducati. Pramac want to win. They, uh, uh, what am I talking about? Not Pramac. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you mean Grassini, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean Grassini. Grassini, obviously, you know, Grassini is not a rich team. They need those performances. Um, you know, it's a situation where they have got corporates that they've got to keep on side, that they've, you know, they're there to race and to, to showcase their, their, you know, assistants, their sponsors. Um, and to be ordered by Ducati, are Ducati going to pick up the lack of bonuses that um, have got, that, that wouldn't, wouldn't be paid? Are, are Ducati going to, you know, pay the deficit in some way, shape or form? No, of course they're not. So I think that, that you know, you can't, have those kind of orders within an independent team and a, and a factory team, in my view. Glad they didn't. We heard from Zaka, didn't we? I think, was it Mizano or maybe the round before, where he was, at, you know, Zaka's a pretty straightforward guy, and he was asked about this, wasn't he? And he sort of gave this, that they, this sort of guidance they'd been given, which was, if you can fight for the win, go for it. And I think that's obviously what we saw on Sunday. But if you're outside the podium, fourth, fifth or sixth, and you're fighting with Banyaya there, then maybe, you know, you just accept the position you're in or whatever else. And it seems like that that's certainly what happened on Sunday, wasn't it? That if they can win, they are allowed to go for it. Now, as he says, though, it's, uh, you know, will they pay, pay the price for that? They want this championship so badly, don't they? You know, they've been waiting for it for so long. What's going to happen now? And I mean, the, the most important thing with this is that it has to be clear, I think, because it's not fair either for Banyaya. You know, if Banyaya was perhaps riding, I don't know, but let's say in future races, if he thinks that Bastianini is not going to overtake, you know, that's also not fair because perhaps he might be able to go faster. So it has to be clear for all of the riders exactly what this situation will be in future so that both of them know. So that Banyaya will be 100% clear. Look, I need to go flat out because he will attack me and not have in the back of his mind, oh, well, maybe we're going to hold position now. Well, that's also a messy situation. So big one for Ducati to manage, isn't it? And, uh, you know, it's uh, as Mar Marquez said as well, you know, he said, look, don't criticise Ducati. Bastianini's still in this title chase. Yes, he's a long way back still, 48 points, but he's still in it. And and with that in mind, you shouldn't be asking someone who still has a mathematical chance to win the championship to back off. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because Bastianini's on a roll now, isn't he, as well? And uh, he has got that top speed. The GP21, you know, we heard after the test at Mizano that Bagnaia, they're focusing on corner speed and maybe prepared to give a bit of top speed up. But we saw that, you know, in a race situation... Top speed can be helpful. Well, we're going to have the same situation when we get the Mategi, that's for sure, because there's a couple of nice fast places there that they, they're they going to need it. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, there's a bit to come yet. And even when you go to Buriram afterwards to Thailand, that's got a long straight as well. Um, so it could be useful. And the great thing about having a fast bike is you ain't got to do so much work in the braking area because you're up alongside already and you've already picked the, the inside line. So um, the guy on the outside has got work to do. And we know how that can end up especially at Buri Ram. <laughs> Alicia Spargro, back on the podium. Needed that, didn't he, Keith? Yeah, I didn't. I picked his team, mate, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but it seemed like Maverick had a million different things going wrong with his bike, so uh, wasn't wasn't really yeah, in contention I mean, it was, in the it end. Was unfortunate. Yeah, I think it, it was... I mean, Alicia to uh, Aragon, uh, again, it's, it's... I think that's the closest one to their home, isn't it? Uh, Aragon, I think, as a, as a racetrack's concerned. But anyway... Um, yeah, he usually goes good there. He feels at home there, and it was a good result for Aleish. Um, unfortunate for Aprilia, because you're right, Maverick uh, had all sorts of things that he was having to deal with. But I think Maverick goes quite well at Motegi, so it's going to be an interesting one again there. It's just a question of whether anybody dares put any money on him, because you never really know with Maverick. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, Alex, I mean, the, the, the two accidents on Friday set him back a bit, didn't they? I think he, he, he knew, as Keith says, this is a good track for him. And I think he knew he, he'd lost points ever since Assen, hasn't he, to, to Quattararo. He knew he needed to gain ground and it, maybe just a little bit over-eager. And he, he, he did admit after Sunday's race that those two accidents on Friday just sort of knocked his confidence a little bit and made him just settle down and remember, look, you you can't afford to not finish here. So, you know, he got the po- podium He's made up points. He's back in it. Was it 17 now? So he's back within one race win. So not a perfect weekend for him, but yeah, it's what he needed to get back in this fight. And he could he be the dark horse if you know we're all looking at uh, Quattararo and Banyaya, and uh, you know maybe maybe that the, the black of Pridia just uh, just comes through them both. Maybe. It's been a sterling season, nonetheless, from the Aprilia rider. They really turned it around this year, or constantly just developing uh, that bike. 194 points then for Alessia Spargro, 17 back from uh, Fabio, and then, as we said, just 10 between Pecco and Fabio. So, title fight, well and truly on, and Anaya still technically in it, but with a bit more uh, work to do. But never say never, after what we've seen at Aragon. Um, those are sort of the title contenders. I, th- I wanted to pick up on a couple of other riders. Um, Brad Binder. KTM enjoyed a, a really good weekend as well, um, a better weekend of late uh, for certain. Do we think, is that more track specific or is it is it an upturn in performance we're hoping to see now? He's always had good rides at Aragon. Mm. I think that somehow, I don't know what it is, It's it's it, when you say track specific, you might be right there. Um, you know, we've seen some great rides from, from Brad Binder at uh, Aragon for some reason or another. It just gets a, it's a track he goes well at and, and seems to like really well. Um, it was a great ride though. And just that kind of that ray of hope that that KTM need at the moment. You just need sometimes you just need a, a little bit of a psychological lift for the whole team to to kind of get it all back on track to to realise that yes we can be here, yes we can be competitive. It's been a dull year for KTM really. Yeah, he, he was really disappointed to miss out on the podium as you can imagine. As he said, he fought like hell. Amazing start, wasn't it? Up to second place. I mean, um, and as he says, he does go around, well around Aragon. He has also crashed out in those first couple of corners, didn't he? Once he clipped Jack Miller a few years back. So he does know that, you know, first lap incidents can happen. But yeah, he threaded his way through. I did ask him, did you have a plan with that? Or was it, you know, he said he just went where the gaps were. So <laughs> real, real instinct stuff. And uh, yeah, he desperately wanted to hold on for that podium. But uh, and he was getting credit from Malaysia. And I think also Jack Miller said, you know, he was riding fantastically. Um, he said he had the best bike of the weekend for the race, but uh, yeah, just couldn't quite hold on those last couple of laps. Aleish was waiting for the tyre to drop on Binder's bike and then sort of pinched it from him. So yeah, he said he was, you know, apart from Qatar, where obviously he was on the podium in the dry, that was his, his best best ride of the season, really. Well, it was good to see uh, Brad Binder up there and fighting in that KTM. But my favourite quote from the weekend uh, was probably Cal Crutchlow saying, well, obviously I was going to be top Yamaha anyway. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, for, for, for Keith, for Cal, Cal's return, well, I mean, it, it was nothing but action-packed, I think it's fair to say. I think he was saying, going into the first corner, why am I back doing this? What the hell have I got into? He's hoping, you know, yeah, got points, top Yamaha, hoping to get a new chassis. We go to Motegi. He's one of the only riders who's had some fairly recent uh, uh, riding round there. So uh, it's all going Cal Crutchlow's way. Well, I mean, Cal Crutchlow is a fighter, isn't he? And he, he enjoys his, he enjoys riding the motorbike, but he doesn't enjoy all the other rubbish that's, that's around. I mean, his, his, his tweet going into, should I be taking pictures of plane wings and <laughs> the dinner I'm having and so on and so forth, was just hilarious. So typically Cal. Um, he's a great motorbike racer. A great motorbike rider. He's been doing things behind the behind the scenes, obviously, as as, as Pete said to us before we came on air. You know, and he's he's tested at Mategi, so he'll know his way around there. You know, he'll have been doing a little bit of work there. Bearing in mind we haven't been there since 2019, and the entire world has changed since then. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting situation for Cal. I mean, uh, he's still fast. I mean, he was there or thereabouts all the way through to come. The thing is with testing, it's probably worth making the distinction between testing and and racing. You know, testing, you're out there pretty much on your own. You've got targets you've got to hit, whether they be longevity targets or whether they be speed targets or whether they be corner entry targets or whatever they're specifically looking to try and move the, the package on with. But then when you get into a situation like a race, and you've heard Binder say it was just going for the gaps, that's what Marquez was doing when he was trying to, you know, do what he was doing in the first couple of couple of corners and it's exactly racing is completely different racing is rubbing particularly in that early early phase of racing where you're trying to pick off any opportunistic move that you can 
Um, and that's what Cal's good at. He's a proper racer. He's a dog. He was, yeah, what's it's not the the dog in the fight, it's the fight in the dog. Well, when it comes down to Cal Crutch, though, he's got plenty of fight in him and he's still got it. And I, uh, you know, I'm so happy to have him back. It was great to see Cal Crutch back at it like that. He's just that that kind of, he doesn't bend too much to the, the, the politically correct kind of, you know, way that we all are nowadays. He's, he pretty much says what he thinks. And I'm, I'm, I love that. I mean, his off track comments are fantastic. More of it, please, Cal. <laughs> Keep it sane. Yeah, he was on great form, wasn't he? On and off track, as you say, Keith, you know, and I mean, to finish, was it 20 seconds off Bastianini in his first race back in a year? I mean, less than a second a lap. I mean, what, what more can he do? Um, so it's going to be great to see what he can what he can do in these last five races. Uh, obviously, had the four races last year, but was switching teams during that time. Um, quicker than he went last year at Aragon. As he said, the bike hasn't really changed that much since then. So, yeah, I mean, that was a strong showing from him. That's a good point you make there, Pete, and that's the bit that I, I was trying to get to, but I kind of fall over myself when I start rambling, is that the, the, because Motegi 2019, we haven't been there, the fact that Yamaha hasn't changed that much might be a might be a bonus when we get to a track that you've got all the data already. Everything else, all the other machinery is pretty much changed and completely different. So the data is going to need updating somewhat in those first few sessions. Mm, certainly will. Well, let's uh, let's leave MotoGP there for the moment and uh, move down to Moto2, if I may be so bold. And it was Pedro Acosta back uh, to his best as he reeled in his teammate, Augusto Fernandez, before eventually pulling away to win. Pete, can you talk us through a bit of the, the Moto2 action? Yeah, Acosta back on form, isn't he? Um, you know, we, we it's, I guess, second win of the season. Um, you know, what we expected coming into the year, we knew he was going to be up there. Uh, obviously, at the some difficult races, some incidents, then the injury with his leg. But, uh, you know, he's showing why people have such big hopes for him in the future. And uh, great, great ride for him, really, throughout the race. Uh, you, you've got the title battle behind Augusto Fernandez, now confirmed in MotoGP, of course, completing the grid. Um, you know, he, he he's there taking a few more points off Agura again. But it's, it's still close, isn't it? And, uh, and unfortunately for Jake Dixon, crashing out in the last lap there, that was... Uh, that was a shame for him, but uh, but yeah, I mean, really, Acosta controlled that race. Difficult weekend for a lot of riders when it came to the kind of grip levels they were expecting, particularly early on in all the races. That you know, it was a, it, it's not an easy racetrack. It was a, you know the, the 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 level of grip just wasn't there in those early few laps for quite a lot of riders. We saw a lot of accidents this weekend, um, and I think that I mean Jake really unfortunate to to, to slide out of it when he did. Um, he had a big off in warm up as well, so it, it kind of like he, he was he was used to tasting a bit of Aragon tarmac already this day. Yeah, well, uh, the title <laughs> fight, as you say, sorry, Pete, just to cut in title fight. Yeah, just seven points between it now. It is it's close? Yeah, no, I was just going to back up what Keith was saying about the the you know the surface. That was really the big talking point on Friday. Was all the riders came in and went, "There's no grip," you know, "There's just so little grip out there." It, it seems that it's the oldest surface on the calendar now aragon so definitely they'll be looking to sort of renew that in the future but yeah marco bezecchi was quite funny about it because everyone was talking about tire drop because of the low grip the tires were spinning so there was a big drop and i said you, you know you, you're struggling with the tire drop and he went no i'm consistently bad so i hope tomorrow <laughs> that i will have some grip so that i then have a tire drop so um... but it, there's a couple of reasons for that often when you've got an overused track like something like Mizano or something like that where it's used a lot so the the little rocks that have got sharp edges on them are all rounded off and polished, so it's a, it's a low grip track. Or the temperature comes up to a level where it all gets a bit greasy because all of the slippery stuff that's in the tarmac comes out and sits on top. And then you've got tracks like Aragon that aren't used very much at all. You know, it's a, it's a low use used track, so it's got to be a combination of one of those three somewhere along the lines. But um, I, I think that that grip was a problem at Aragon across the classes, which is unusual. Sometimes it's a Dunlop type problem. Sometimes it's a Michelin type problem. This week, it was everybody's problem. <laughs> everybody's problem. Well, uh, certainly Augusto Fernandez sitting pretty for the time being ahead of Ayagura, Canet and Vietti. Uh, just seven points, though, as we say, between uh, Fernandez and Agura. So Moto2, one to certainly watch. We get into these, uh, well, crunch time really in, in the MotoGP championship and um, worth picking up though I think Keith on uh, Augusto Fernandez and he will be a MotoGP 2023 rider uh, he is the last in a series of uh, pieces of the puzzle that have been put together to form our full lineup alongside uh, well Taka Nakagami will keep his LCR Honda seat 
Did you see those two moves coming? Well, they've been, you know, like we, we can all be smart and say, yeah, I saw them coming. But then again, you could have had several different mm. combinations of things that could have been coming and you could have made that claim anyway. I mean, I'm glad to see it's all set at last. We're all sorted. We know what's going on for 2023. Nakagami was the one that surprised me slightly. I understand the reasons for Honda because they want that consistency of um, data input and so on and so forth. And Nakagami's quite good at that. So they've hung on to him in that, you know. Would have been nice to see Nakagami finish a race at Aragon. I mean, that was the one, the, the one and only chance. Perhaps he should have won, you know, some years ago and and, and blew it at the first turn. Um, I, personally, I would have I'd liked to see, you know, a change, perhaps. Um, but Taka's got another year. Um, as far as Fernandez is concerned, good move. Should suit him. Let's wait and see next year. The only other bit of news that we did get, not an official announcement as such, was the, the spec of the VR46 bikes. And uh, so Marini, he'll be staying on the bike he's got now, basically. So he won't have the 2023 20, bike like uh, the Pramac guys and the factory team. So different to this year, where he's the fifth guy on the latest bike, he'll keep the bike he's got. Bezeki will also be on a year old bike, but of course he is now. So he'll move from the 21 to the 22 next year. Same bike as uh, Marini has now. I mean, Marini tried to put a brave face on it, but obviously all riders want the latest bike. You know, he sort of joked, well, I hope they don't make too much of a step <laughs> over the winter. Um, <laughs> um, Is that, I mean, just uh, my brain's frazzled slightly because I've, had a, I've also had a weekend at the Goodwood Revival wearing strange clothing and um, trying to talk about various things that are much older than even talking me. Talking about four um, wheels. Yeah, well, there were a bit of four wheels, of course. I did take a passing interest in that. Um, yeah. Anyway, we'll move forward. Um, <laughs> what are the changes next year regarding the um, the shapeshifters, the, the the whole shop devices? I, I think that we've we've got, you know, they're taking them away, aren't they? I think they're banned for next year, or we got to have the, a rear one still. Yeah, the, the the front system is banned from next year, so that's the compromise they got. So yeah, we'll still have the rear ones, but the front ones, which. Uh, the Pramac guys have sort of been using off and on this year, haven't they? They they will be gone. Yeah. Ban a lot of them. Um, but my, uh... um, I should say, I think the whole shot device, so just at the start, that will continue on the front. So it'll just be out of the corners in the race that they won't be able to use this special sort of I don't system. understand these, these tiggling around the edges type things sometimes. I mean, the whole shot device stays. So we've still got that possibility of a failure from... Um, from the front end as far as that's concerned if they're all if they're all banned and we've got no whole shot device then we're all launching in the same manner which would seem to make sense to me rather than um having half a use of a a device on the front end anyway just my opinion what do you think let the, us know the, the, some discussion also of course because of mark's accident with nakagami that occurred with wings and involved ride height devices but then you had someone like jack miller going well hang on a minute if you ram into yeah. the back of a bike there's yeah, going to be say, stuff breaking <laughs> it's not often you <laughs> so, try to force speed a fairing into the rear wheel is exactly it, so it was a yeah he, he felt it was certainly a bit of a tenuous leap to uh to make that I, I just think have we have i made this up have they confirmed the calendar for next year now did I see no, that? No, no. no. There, there's been there's been a, sort of a, a leak of the kind. If you like, Speed Week have put out what they believe will be Gunther Weisinger, who's very well connected, so it should be pretty close. What he believes the calendar will be. Yeah, normally it would be out by now. So, um, so yeah, it does sort of indicate that there's still some talks ongoing. Mm. Um, normally there is the, the first provisional list is out by the time you leave Europe for the flyby. Gunther Weisinger, you know, he he was a he was a journalist in my day. You know, Gunter Wiesinger has been around for he's he's he might even be taller than you, Harry. He's a great big tall fella, and he still gets the scoops. And it's for a, a you know an online website, effectively, effectively Speed Week. It's not a, a publication of any kind, but still he gets the information. And ninety nine point nine percent of the time, the bloke is right. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, if you Gunter Wiesinger, what a legend. Well, he's welcome on the show anytime. If he gets the calendar scoop, he can come back on. He can come on for the first time. The only reason I mentioned that is just because looking ahead to next year, you're saying, you know, that would be a normal decision, maybe to ban everything, but normal and straightforward doesn't quite go hand in hand with the, the way motorsport operates sometimes. Um, and speaking of, um, I'd like to go to Moto3, if I may, and to talk about that incident uh, where two members of the uh, Sterling Garda Husqvarna Max uh, team 
have been fined and suspended uh, from the Australian and Malaysian Grand Prix after they were caught deliberately trying to obstruct Tech 3's Adrian Fernandez as he attempted to leave the pits, presumably to stop him following one of their riders, trying to get a slipstream, whatever. But, I mean, Keith, I watched the little video clip over and over again, and it just got worse and worse and worse. I, I mean, I have you ever seen anything of that kind of magnitude in your time? No, never. Wow. Never from that perspective. But then again, it, the slipstream was never as important back in mm. the day as it is now. I think the fact of the matter is, is that we've seen frustration about people trying to get a toe. It's been something that's been a bone of contention for as long as you like, you know, because basically you're giving someone half a second, maybe a second on some tracks, if you can get in the right place behind somebody else. That's a fact, particularly in Moto3. So the frustration is there all the time. But unsportsmanlike behaviour in pit lane of all places where it should be pretty sterile you don't interfere with some. You don't even go in front of somebody else's garage. You know, clear off, stay in your own area. Don't come into someone else's domain just to try and hold up a rider and ruin his his thought process and his focus. You know, there's so many things that could have gone wrong at that point. I have, I cannot understand how they came to that collectively. There was two of them. I mean, even if there was one rogue rider, but they must have spoken to each other to have wandered into the domain of another rider's, you know, frontage in front of the, the pit box. So there must have been a conversation that went on between the two of them that said that they were going to wander in front to try and block him off. Um, you know, I think Biaggi was very, very, you know, polite straight away on the case. Press release came out, massive apologies all around to to distance himself, distance the team from the actions of the, the two rogue mechanics. I mean, I think the underlying thing is, is that it's become so critical to get a slipstream that even the mechanics are feeling it to the point where, you know, these two felt that they ought to go and impede um, another rider. You know, did they get enough? 2,000 euro fine each. If they're having to pay it, that's good. Thank you very much. They don't get paid that much as mechanics. I mean, some people think they do, but they don't, especially not in a Moto3 team. Um, banned from two two trips. Well, to be honest, after the amount of stick they're going to be getting and the way that they're going to be ostracized in the paddock for what they've done, um, I think a couple of meetings off will probably do them good than having to face people when they're out there. So, um I mean, they, they didn't get instant bans, though, did they? Because they deemed that that that, that uh, Biaggi wouldn't be able to replace them in time, and therefore it created a safety issue within within the team. Difficult to see how they could have done it any different, to be honest. Whether the fine is enough, I don't know. I mean, it 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 was it was an idea that went completely wrong. Whatever these two guys thought they were going to achieve from standing in front of another rider before he went out, so that it blocked him from going to possibly slipstream their rider. I've got no idea where the thought process could have come from because no right-minded person anywhere in that paddock would have thought that. You know, I, I can't I, I can't find somebody that will even defend them a tiny bit, even though everyone knows the reasons why. Um, but I can't find anybody that would that would even think that that was even slightly reasonable. I mean, Keith said it all there. I mean, the, the only few bits that I can maybe add is that it seems that the, one of the mechanics, he did actually grab the front brake on the, on the bike. So yeah, you could just, see that. Yeah, I mean, so so also physically interfered with another bike. Um, in terms of the fine and things, that's from uh, the FIM stewards, isn't it? Biaggi, obviously, is the team boss. They will have their own disciplinary procedure. They can, you know, that's that doesn't have to be the end of it. So they can still get fines and and who knows what from, from Biaggi as the team boss, uh, you know, depending on whatever procedure they have within the team. Then there's also these these rumours that seem true that there was another altercation between uh, these guys later that evening. And, uh, yeah, in the paddock. So it, it seems it continued. And um, it, I think it's the subject of police investigations. It sounds like there was some physical violence. So... Yeah, very, I mean, shocking, just shocking all around that, that it started the first place and uh, it's ended up in this situation. As Keith says, they would have been banned straight away, but there, there were some people missing from Aragon anyway because of the difficulties in getting visas for Japan. You have to physically send your passport to a Japanese embassy, etc., etc. So, you know, it, this is why they're not immediately being pulled out from the next two races. It's why they have, as Keith says, given a bit of time and space so that they can find some replacements. But uh, yeah, un unbelievable, I think... Uh, as he says, you just couldn't believe your eyes as to what was going on. And, and to do that with all the cameras in pit lane, they must have, you know, what, what were they thinking? 
I, I, I mean, I just what I watching that clip was. You, just, you it look didn't look real. It was just so bizarre. I've never seen anything like that in any kind of sport. But just to hear you guys also say the same thing, just I think highlights the uh, the the just highlights how mad it was. But in terms of um, the racing action, then if we come on to that, uh, it was Isan Guevara who led from the start to win again, uh, whilst his uh, title rivals, uh, Dennis Foggia, Sergio Garcia, sort of struggled really in the, ending up in the latter end of, uh, of the points. Um, but a great ride uh, from Guevara, perhaps a championship defining ride, 33 points now the gap. I think you said it, you know, it's when you need to stand up and do what he did, he did it, you know, in fine style. It was, you know, to grab the 25 points now with what, how many races have we got left? Five. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's one in the eye for the rest of them. Everyone else has become inconsistent but Rivera is there or thereabouts all the time. So, um, you know, they've got some tough rounds to come. It's not easy now. You know, it's it's there are some some awkward rounds to come, and they're coming thick and fast as well, which means that you know an injury you pick up an injury anywhere here, and this can can close right up again. Um, we'll see, but he looks like he's got one end on it, doesn't he? Yeah, it was a it was a big win for him, wasn't it? I mean, he's the, the Moto Three is the one with the biggest gap going into these flyaways now with uh, with what happened to Quattararo. So uh, yeah, it's going to be up to the. Uh, I mean, Garcia's got to respond pretty 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 swiftly um, because otherwise. It, Gravara's going to be out of reach now. So, uh, yeah, and as you say, Foggia, he sort of looked like he was fighting back, didn't he? The past few races, it, it looked like it, he might be coming on strong again, but just really sort of never looked like he was going to feature at the front in that race. And uh, it's it's hard to see that he can come back from that now. So, yeah, uh, Gra- uh, Gravara, yes, he's, uh, he's one hand on the title, I think you'd say at this stage. But, you know, as he says, there's a lot of unknown rounds coming up. So, uh, yeah. You can't be confident of anything yet, but uh, yeah, a big, big win for him. Certainly was. Well, five races to go and we're straight into the next one. As we've said, Japan Motegi after two years away. Last time we were there was 2019, Keith. So fill us in. Tell us about the track. What we've got to watch out for. Uh, Motegi is, is the whole thing about going to Japan is, is pretty special anyway. Um, and where the track is, I mean, it's a Honda own track. It's one of those situations where it's got... The, it's twin ring Motegi, which is a right old mouthful. Um, fact of the matter is it's got an oval course, you know, you car guys, Indy car course there. Um, and on the inside of it, of course, is this wonderful, you know, goes underneath the track, you go tunnels, you've got all sorts of things going on, fast stuff, slow stuff. Um, I like Motegi. Uh, there's the, the Honda Racing Mu- Museum that's there as well. You've got the Honda robots in there. I mean, there's quite a lot. It's in the middle of nowhere. You know, you're talking about up in the hills. You know, the nearest hotels are an hour or so away, um, unless you're staying at the rather weird um, trackside hotel, which is about as dead as any hotel I've ever come across in my entire life. Honestly, it's like it's like being on the moon. It's like a pod on the moon. It reminds me of the Eagles song, you can check out, but you can never leave. You know, you can imagine <laughs> they stab it with their steely knives. <laughs> it's kind of a slightly strange place. But some people stay there, but I, I prefer staying down at... Um, a bit further away uh, there's a there's a there's a pub called the drunken duck of all things it's owned by an aussie i mean we go all the way to japan and we're in an aussie bar and and the strangest thing is is that it's obviously cool for the japanese as well because it's just full of <laughs> locals so it's kind of an aussie bar um that's full of us plus a load of locals all getting completely out of control um which is really odd in japan because it is the most orderly place i've ever been to in my life um the the trip into the track the, the Japanese drivers are mega considerate. They give way. They, you know, so when you go there, uh, you know, racers, racers, mechanics, all the hangers on, all of us lot um, that are there, you drive quite aggressively. You know, you want it, you need to get places in a hurry. Well, in Japan, you can abuse that because you can drive down the outside of the traffic and they all move out the way. You can go to, you can absolutely go through red lights. You do, you, you, cut across country or wherever you might be and they'll all just politely move out of the way it's incredible <laughs> and when you've got an aeroplane to catch after after the event because most people try and get on an aeroplane on sunday night if they can and it's a long way into tokyo um you've got a hell of a trip um to cut through all the sunday night traffic that's that's quite it's quite busy in japan as you might imagine even when you're coming across and if you you've, you've got you know narita or, or haneda two two airports that you've got to try and get to one or the other to to get internationally to get out of there and it is, you cut it fine, believe me. 
but you've never seen anything like it in all years. It's like wacky races. You can go down the wrong side of the road, getting out the circuit, you just you just drive straight at everybody. And go, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this, by the way, but it is something that you have to do to catch your flight if you're going to get home or to the next track. Um, the track itself is... I can't imagine how the eco warriors of the world um, saw the uh, annihilation of the top of two hills to put a concrete racetrack in the middle of what you would think is pristine countryside. I can't imagine it happening anywhere else in the world now, um, or perhaps even then, because it, they topped basically two dirty great big hills and put this facility in what you would consider to be pristine countryside, um, which is, you know, is an odd position. But having done that, and dismissing that particular ecological disaster, I'm sure some people saw it as, um, you've got a really, really good facility, a great facility. I really like going to Motegi. Um, it's one of those ones where, you know, you walk the track and you can, you, 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 you feel it. it, it makes you tingle. It's got everything you want um, at the track. Um, and, the, and again, the, the cultural difference there, um, you know, when you, 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 the press office and the, and the food that's supplied to you, you know, it's Japanese food is not everybody's cup of tea, that's for sure. And a lot of people that aren't used to it, you know, where's me Heinz baked beans? It's, um, it's a, it's a, it, it does have a slight juxtaposition to, to quite a lot of people. So the whole event, it's well lit. You know, you've got great big lights up on the top that they can use for the, for the, um, over the top of the paddocks and stuff like that, which they could use for the Indy cars. Um, I've mentioned the museum, but the, if you go for a walk about and get to the public side of things as well, there's a lot to see from from there. And, and the Japanese have this wonderful, even though they may support Nakagami, you'll find that there will be a segment of the, there will be a fan club for every single different rider across all the classes. And they, they, the Japanese find somebody that they support, and it's a lifelong support. If they support John McPhee which they do, um, there will be a big group of John McPhee fans and they'll all stick together and they'll have their part, their area that they are. And if there's Jack Miller fans in MotoGP, you know, obviously everyone's a Jack Miller fan, so maybe that's not a great example. But some of the more bizarre riders that, that you, you don't think about. And then there's the the past riders that you'll find fan clubs at trackside for the past riders that, that don't even have not raced for God knows how many. I've never found a Keith Ewan fan club. So I, I was going to say, have they got Keith Ewan masks and all this kind of stuff? Is it the Keith Ewan grandstand? <laughs> no, they hand me a mask, so I, I wear it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it's, it is, it's a unique atmosphere. And again, it's, do you know what? We are so lucky in, in Grand Prix motorbike racing because just about every single place we go to is unique to itself. They, they, you can find a virtue for everything. You, you asked me about track you know, track tips and stuff like that. Every week we talk about a track and I always find myself finding the positive side of it because every track has a positive side to it. Every track is unique. You, you know, the only way you're going to find out, folks, is if you've got a sugar daddy or, or somebody who's paying for your trips or you can become a journalist and then you'll find out how hard it really yeah. is um, and, and go to go to all the tracks. If you if you ever win the win the lottery or something along those lines, I could highly recommend, you know, travelling to every single racetrack in a year would be like a dream for most people. It is. It was a dream for me. I mean, to be, to, to be, I don't do it now, obviously, but to, to be able to do it in the past, particularly when someone else was paying, <laughs> is a, is a, you know, a privilege. It's not something that I ever took for granted. And, uh, and thank you very much, PT, is all I can say. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> Peace and love. I mean, it is it's it's a it is a, a lot of dreams uh, dreams for a lot of people. But yeah, if you can do it for free, then uh, that's the way you do it. Or get somebody else to pay. Uh, <laughs> Pete, you're not going out to uh, Japan. Um, you just come back though from Spain, obviously. Um, what are you watching out for then? Anything? Uh, any any Pete's picks for this week? Without giving your well, without just... giving your predictions away, because we'll do that in a minute. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I think the first thing to mention is that. Of course, the rookies since 2020 have never raced at this track. So I, I make it 10 riders that, that will not have raced a MotoGP bike at this track. Very good point. Coming into this weekend. So yeah, so I, shall, I will list them because it took me some time to list. So Brad Binder, Alex Marquez, Jorge Martin, and Air Bastianini, Marini. Uh, and then the five for this year, of course, was Eki Antonio, Darren Binder, Gardner, and Fernandez. So none of those guys have raced a MotoGP bike at, at this wow. track. 
And uh, so this is why, you know, it, it is going to be really interesting. We've also got a bit of a delayed schedule because um, of, of getting people physically to Japan with the freight and things like that. So the Friday practice has been pushed back a bit. Uh, you know, this ty- on, on uh, Sunday in Aragon, everyone's looking at weather maps and worried about the typhoon that was coming through and if that was going to be delayed. But I, I think from what I, I hear from the, you know, the friends that were in the media room then and, and that have gone to Japan, they, they've arrived okay and everything seems to be all right. But I think we... Still, I think we could be in for a wet, wet weekend, so that would also uh, that would also spice things up even further. As Keith says, you're up in the mountains. I mean, it's this massive civil engineering project. I mean, uh, and yet, and yet, contrasted with that, you've got sort of fairly sparse sort of paddock facilities in the in the sense that there's porter cabin kind of things for the teams, and and the media room is sort of got this bit of temporary look to it. And yet, you've got these other other parts of it that are vast grandstands and the oval. And so real, as Keith said, real unique place, but. Uh, but yeah, I think this is the big thing is that nobody's been there for a long time. The Japanese teams, they will have been there in private testing, of course. You know, they would have done private laps. We were talking about Crutchlow, but also Suzuki and um, Honda as well. We've got a couple of wild cards, Honda wild card. We should say the Suzuki wild card. He is now going to be replacing Juan Mir. So Suda, who's the test rider, he was going to be on the third bike, sort of a bit of a final farewell and a thank you for the testing job he's done alongside Guintoli. Uh, in Suzuki's final home race with Mia out of this weekend he will now just take over if you like the full-time place alongside Rin so there won't be let's say another substitute for Mia this weekend Uh, Um, so yeah do we do we think Taka's going to be okay for this weekend good question that's a very good question um I would suggest you know he might have a go but he he doesn't look that great does he at the end of the day so it'll be a disaster for him at home Grand Prix Remember, Cal Crutchlow has gone quite well here before in the past. So uh, I, I'm, it's going to be a great weekend for, for Cal. I've got that feeling about it. And as Pete's already said, he's he's tested there. I've not got him in my top three. but certainly <laughs> I was going to say, that really would be a sporting no, it's going to be, bet. <laughs> it would be a sporting bet, but it w- wouldn't be one that's outrageous. And Pete's already touched on the, the subject of the weather. You can't be sure what weather you're going to get there. It could be baking hot or it could be slinging it down with rain. And we've had both over the same weekend. So it's um it, it's going to be a major major event. Pete's research brilliant because you know, I hadn't actually touched on some of the the rookies there as well. I mean that comes down to data now. Nowadays it doesn't take them long to get up to speed. But if you add that the rookie side to what I said earlier on, the fact that that, that, that a lot of these bikes don't have data, um, to combine all of that with the relatively short time they're going to have on track, it's a big ask. Particularly if you build in the fact that we could have variable weather. That is going to be a really, really tough weekend for, for all your technicians, which is why Quattararo is in a very good place. I feel, oh, uh, you, don't to... you dare start getting in your predictions. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, we'll come, we'll come to next. One thing, I've got the times for Japan, or if I got them wrong, because I know you said they're delayed, but they're, they're quite palatable for European times. They're sort of the race getting going at sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, UK time. It's all about you, isn't it, well, Harry? Well, no, I'm, the only reason I ask is that I'm really annoyed because I'm doing Japan F1 in, like, in two weeks after that, and it's bloody three o'clock in the morning uh, UK time. So horrific. MotoGP gets a better deal out of that one. You'll just be coming in then to do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, come on then. Let's uh, let's get the predictions in. As you say, it's uh, going to be quite a hard one to predict. After last week, um, everyone get everyone got at least a point. I got the one point for Aleish. Uh, sadly, Vinales and Miller did not come through. Pete extends his lead by getting Bagnaia and Aleish on the podium. And Keith, you also get another couple of points for Bagnaia and Bastianini. So it's tight still. Pete, 17 points. Keith, 15 and I'm just there with 13 so five races to go we might have to have a tiebreaker uh, at the end of it or could it start to uh, eke out a gap let me have your top three please Keith you seemed keen oh, me first. you seemed keen you can go first <laughs> well Quattararo's in there as you will have no surprise mm-hmm. over um, I'm going to go Quattararo yeah. Bastianini I think he's got momentum at the minute and I think he'll go well there and uh, Bang Naya there's my three okay Pete, I was going to have the same three, so I'm going to change it, and I, I'm going to go for, <laughs> for I'm going to go for wet weather, <laughs> and so I'm going to go for Jack Miller to win on his final Jack- Ducati appearance yeah. in Mategi in the rain. Uh, I would have gone for Bastianini to win if it's dry. I have to say, um, I'll go Bagnaia second and Quattararo third. Okay. Oh right. Okay. Um, I am going to go. I also think it might be wet. Um, 
So I, uh, but I'm going to go for a Banyaya win. And then I'm going to go for a... Oh, Miller second. And I'm going to go Binder third. I think he's good in the wet and uh, coming off the back of some form. He has nothing to lose. Bin to third. Did you put an elation there, Pete? Did you put elation there? Anywhere? No one's put elation anywhere. Yeah, I tell you what, that might be. We might have overlooked somebody there. Well, they're locked yeah, in. I mean, I'm there's afraid. So, there's they're locked so many in. That, that you can't change. Yeah, I mean, It'll be Luca Marini on the podium, probably for all, for all our luck. <laughs> well, um, well, let us know your podium wet, predictions yeah, I mean. as always. We read them in the comments. Some people, some people get them spot on, and some people are just way off. But then again, I'm usually way off. Um, but I think that just about does it then. So uh, just a couple of days uh, and then we're back into more action on the track in Japan. So in the meantime, make sure you tuned in uh, across Crash.net for all the latest uh, news and analysis as usual across the week. And then we'll be right back with you next week. Get your questions in, leave them in the comments section or tweet Instagram or Facebook us. Just search Crash Moto GP. And please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps us and we shall see you right back here next week. But from myself, Keith and Pete, bye-bye. <laughs>